You've probably heard somewhere that curved 2D space bends into the third dimension, and curved 3D space into the fourth, but how true is that statement? Maybe it is true, or perhaps only up to a specific dimension n, but stops being true after. First, we need to define what bending into a higher dimensional space means, and whatever definition we use, it's generally false, with the exception of one-dimensional spaces. There are indeed specific cases where this is true. For example, consider the graph of a function with two inputs and one output. We can see a bending into the third dimension, the new direction described by the dependent variable. As another example, a circle naturally lives in two-dimensional space, and a two-dimensional sphere lives in three, and generally, n-dimensional hyperspheres live in n plus one-dimensional space. But these nice ones are exceptions, not the rule. As per the question of how many extra dimensions are actually needed, we can first split the question into topology and geometry. For the topological part, we're interested in how twisted and tangled the space is, and how many extra dimensions are needed to untangle it. As for the geometric part, we're interested in how curved the space is. For example, the hyperbolic plane is topologically equivalent to the flat 2D plane, but it is much more stretched out. And if you try to take a reasonably small region on the hyperbolic plane and fit it into flat 3D space, maybe you could guess that it could be impossible to fit the entire infinite plane in flat 3D space. Now, answering how many dimensions we actually need to untangle all the twists, and then on top of that, account for all the possible ways it can stretch and curve, is just too big of a task to fit into a margin of a single video. So we will save the geometric part for another day and tackle the topology. In this video, we will mainly focus on the intuition behind this topological twist, and how it prevents the object from existing in lower dimensions. Let's start off with some topology where we don't actually care about rigid quantities like distance, angle, or curvature. This deformed sphere sits nicely in usual 3D space, and we call this an embedding. Now, choose any point on the sphere, you're allowed to walk in two independent directions. And this holds for every point on the sphere, so we call it a two-dimensional manifold, or simply a two-manifold. The sphere is embedded into R3, and we call that the ambient space, which itself is a three-manifold. Flatlanders living on the sphere would have no idea it's embedded in a higher dimension, but as 3D creatures, we are aware of that extra up direction. The number of extra dimensions is called the co-dimension of the embedding, which in this case is 1. In general, it's the dimension of the ambient space minus the dimension of the manifold. Now, if you have a loop embedded in R3, then you can only move in one direction, but you are aware of extra two dimensions in the ambient space, so the co-dimension of this embedding is 2. In the previous examples, the embeddings were into Euclidean space, but we could just as well easily embed a circle into a sphere, using the sphere as the ambient space. But for the rest of the video, we will only focus on embeddings into Euclidean space. Now, we need to introduce a weaker notion than embedding, called immersion. Roughly speaking, it's like an embedding, but we allow self-intersections. But if you look at any formal textbook definition, immersion has nothing to do with self-intersections. So what does it actually mean? This is the world map of Dark Souls 2. You can see different zones intersecting each other, but when you're actually playing the game, only the local region is loaded, so you would never realize those overlaps exist. Unless you're using glitches to clip through one zone into another. And this essentially is what an immersion is. Imagine a one-dimensional creature living in a simulated universe where only the local region is ever loaded. Then, to him, the world is no different from a true circle unless he finds a glitch in the matrix. Klein Bottle is the most well-known example of a surface that can be immersed but not embedded in R3. And we actually need the fourth dimension to untangle this self-intersection. Now, it's important to point out that manifolds can exist as an abstract manifold and don't need to be immersed or embedded in a higher dimensional space. For example, if we treat the left and right boundaries of this disk as portals, we can see that this is a representation of a sphere, which does not require any higher dimensions. But for this video, we're more interested in how many dimensions we actually need to realize a manifold as an immersion or an embedding. The first of these results was proven by Whitney. He showed that every n-dimensional manifold can be immersed in two n-dimensions and embedded in two n plus one dimensions. Not too long after, he tightened that result by one dimension. And in the process, he discovered what we now call vector bundles. To understand what in the world that is, let's start with the usual Cartesian product. This is a space where each point can be described by two coordinates, and each coordinate describes a point on a line. And the resulting product is a plane. Now, let's take a look at that from a bundle theoretic point of view. Let's place down a line, which we can call the base space. And for each point on the line, we can grow a fiber that's also a line. 
which we call the fiber space. And the resulting space is called the fiber bundle, which in this case is just a plane. Now, let's take a look at a more interesting example. An interval bundle over a circle. If the resulting space is the same as the Cartesian product, we call it a trivial bundle. But unlike the previous example, there is also a non-trivial bundle, which we can get by adding a twist, and the resulting space is called the Möbius strip. It turns out there are only two possible interval bundles over a circle. The Möbius strip is topologically distinct from a cylinder, and one evidence is that the Möbius strip has a single loop as a boundary. If we twist it a second time, the resulting surface is topologically equivalent to a cylinder. It has two boundaries like a regular cylinder, and it has two distinct sides like a regular cylinder. So there are two distinct interval bundles over a circle. Now, let's start with vector bundles, which are special kinds of fiber bundles. If there is a vector at every point in space, we call it a vector field. Every vector points in some direction within the plane and not off into some higher dimension, and we call these tangent vectors. The term tangent vector is an abstraction of concrete tangent vectors of an immersed manifold, which we can think of as an instantaneous velocity at a point. The collection of all these tangent vectors at a single point forms the tangent plane. Now, back to our plane, the space of all possible tangent vectors is called the tangent bundle. To describe an element on the tangent bundle, we need two pairs of coordinates, one pair to specify a point in space, and a second pair to describe the direction of the vector. This means the tangent bundle is a four-dimensional manifold. Now, the big question is, is the tangent bundle a trivial plane bundle, or a bundle with some twists? Although it's incredibly difficult to visualize four-dimensional manifolds, we have a result from calculus that can tell us if a bundle is trivial or not. For a two-dimensional vector bundle, if we can find two independent, smooth, non-vanishing vector fields, then the tangent bundle is trivial. Now, let's contrast that with the tangent bundle on a sphere. Every smooth vector field on a sphere must vanish somewhere, and this result is known as the Harry Ball theorem. So, the tangent bundle is not a trivial plane bundle. So, to what extent is this bundle twisted? For a deep reason, there cannot be a twist that exceeds the dimension of the original manifold. If the tangent bundle of the sphere were trivial, it would have two independent, non-vanishing vector fields. But the Harry Ball theorem tells us there is none, which means there is at least a second-level deficiency, and we will call that a second-degree twist. This only demonstrates the existence of degree 2 twist, but not the first. Now, the normal bundle is trivial since there is an outward normal field that is nowhere vanishing. Using the same logic, the normal bundle is a one-dimensional bundle. Since we can find the one linearly independent non-vanishing field, we know its twist is at degree 0, meaning there is no twist at all. Now, the tangent bundle of the ambient space, which is a real 3D space, is automatically trivial. So, the three-dimensional bundle on the sphere, where the vectors can point in any direction in the 3D ambient space, is also a trivial bundle. The three independent non-vanishing fields are simply the vectors in x, y, and z directions of the ambient space. And this type of vector bundle, which points in any direction within the ambient space, is called, as you guessed it, the ambient bundle. Now, let's go back to the Möbius strip. Its tangent bundle is non-trivial. There is one field that goes along the strip, but for the other direction, if you go all the way around, we can see that it has to be zero somewhere. Since we have a two-dimensional vector bundle that has only one independent field, we can say there is a degree one twist. In fact, the degree one twist that we've been talking about is actually the non-orientability of the manifold. For the same reason, the normal bundle has to be non-trivial as well. In general, if an n-dimensional manifold is embedded or immersed in the Euclidean space of co-dimension k, we did see earlier that the tangent bundle and the k-dimensional normal bundle together forms the ambient bundle, which is always trivial. What happens is that the tangent bundle is twisted, and the normal bundle provides just enough counter-twist to stabilize each other, adding up to a trivial bundle. As we saw in the case of a sphere, the normal bundle is untwisted, but it provides just enough dimensional leeway to stabilize the tangent bundle. As a partial converse, there is a very strong criterion for immersibility. Let's take a look at a version of those theorems. The tangent bundle is an intrinsic bundle that lives on the manifold, while the normal bundle exists only when the manifold is mapped into an ambient space. 
This theorem says that if you can find any k-dimensional vector bundle nu that stabilizes a tangent bundle, then an immersion of co-dimension k must exist. And nu is appropriately named a virtual normal bundle. So we have some very powerful tools for immersion, but not so much for embedding. At the time of making this video, this is the current best known embedding dimensions of n-manifolds. For powers of 2, it is the same as the Whitney bound. And for every other number greater than 1, it has been slightly improved to 2n minus 1. Perhaps, what's more interesting are the non-embedding dimensions. Massey constructed manifolds for each dimension that cannot be embedded in these specific higher dimensions. If you're up for some challenge, pause to guess what this alpha function is from these numbers. Or maybe another 8 to see the pattern better. Notice how the gaps between the non-embedding and the embedding dimensions are growing. An unproven conjecture is that the embedding dimension for all n manifolds is actually just one above the non-embedding dimension. As per what alpha is, it is the number of ones in the binary representation of the number. So for example, 5 is 101, so the total count is 2. And 15 is 1111, so the total count is 4. And for any powers of 2, the value is 1. That looks oddly specific, doesn't it? In fact, the spaces that were used as examples for non-immersion are products of real projective spaces of dimensions that are powers of 2. So what the heck is a real projective space? Let's use the ball model to explain it. Let's start with RP1. A one-dimensional ball is just an interval. Now, if you just think of the two boundaries as a portal, the space becomes a circle. For RP2, we start with the two-dimensional ball, which is just a disk, then imagine the boundary as a portal. So if you exit from one end, you re-enter from the opposite side. If I draw arrows to show how the boundaries are identified, you may notice the surface is twisted, meaning it's not orientable. It takes quite a bit of imagination to picture this as an immersion in 3D space. RP3 follows the same idea. We start with the solid ball and treat each boundary as a portal that makes you reappear on the opposite side. As per immersion, the story is much better than embedding. Of course, we have similar lower bounds for non-immersion, with same examples. But unlike embeddings, it is proven that every compact manifold can be immersed in at worst one dimension higher than the non-immersion dimension. Cohen's work is too complex, but we can briefly touch on the dark magic behind Massey's works. The highest degree twist of the virtual normal bundle obstructs any immersion in co-dimension less than k. But this notion of twist is generally hard to compute. Fortunately, there is a weaker, easier to compute algebraic invariant that partially captures it, called the Stiefel Whitney classes. If w equals 1, a twist must exist. But if w is 0, a twist may still exist, but it's not strong enough to capture that information. So let's take RP4 for example. The Stiefel Whitney classes for the tangent bundle are computed as follows. If this were to be a trivial bundle, there would only be the zeroth class. Now, then the associated virtual normal bundle would have the following classes. Since if we treat this as a polynomial and multiply the classes, we get 1, taking the result modulo x to the fifth and 2. Now, this implies that the combined ambient bundle is a trivial bundle. Combining this with all the previous results, there is no immersion in co-dimension 2 or lower. As I said, this is a complete dark magic. It would take research-level algebraic topology to fully understand. So let's leave it here, and hopefully this gave you a good glimpse of what modern topology is like. As always, thank you for watching.